Hello, you're watching News Mongolia on MNB World, and I'm your host, Jaral Ma Jaral. Our top stories for today. Mongolia and South Korea forge deeper ties in information technology. Celebrating the vibrancy of Mongolian language, poetry, and culture in Stockholm. Amr Dovshin Inkbat receives the 2024 Bistanini Prize. For the news, stay tuned. Mongolia and the Republic of Korea are forging deeper ties in information technology during the third summit for democracy held from 18th to 20th of March. Details are from MNB's special reporter in Seoul, Ijil Bolt. In a significant stride towards technological advancement, Mongolia is bolstering its collaboration with South Korea in the realm of information technology. The Minister of Digital Development and Communication, Ochil, convened a pivotal bilateral meeting with South Korea's Minister of Science and ICT, Lee Jun ho amidst the backdrop of the esteemed Third Summit for Democracy hosted in South Korea from March 18 to 20th. This strategic meeting between the two countries' delegations serves as a platform for envisioning the trajectory of their cooperation in e-government, communication and information technology. Following the discussions, Mongolia and South Korea inked a landmark memorandum of understanding. This pivotal agreement signed between the Ministry of Digital Development and Communication of Mongolia and the Ministry of Science and ICT of the Republic of Korea paves the way for enhanced collaboration in the fields of communications and information technology. In 2022, South Korea hosted the inaugural Asia-Pacific Digital Ministerial Conference, setting the stage for deeper collaboration. Building upon discussions held during this conference, Mongolia's proposal for expanded cooperation materialized into this notable agreement. Recognizing South Korea's prowess in ICT, Mongolia aims to foster partnerships in AI and satellite technology. This mutual endeavor is exemplified by the establishment of a digital skill center at ICT Park in 2022 with support from South Korea, aimed at enhancing the capabilities of Mongolian professionals. In a harmonious fusion of literary prowess and cultural exchange, a momentous gathering took place in Stockholm as the Mongolian Embassy in the Kingdom of Sweden orchestrated the enchanting spring warmth event. This auspicious occasion held in commemoration the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the two countries, served as a vibrant tapestry interwoven with the rich threads of Mongolian language poetry and culture. Details from MNB's reporter in Sweden, Alter Hishek. Under the distinguished patronage of Ambassador Jan Bazar, luminaries from the realms of literature and poetry converged to partake in the celebration of artistic camaraderie. The event bore witness to the presence of esteemed writer and poet Kamjavi Mindoya, adorned with the prestigious order of Genghis Khan, whose profound words echoed the essence of the Mongolian heritage. In his poignant opening address, Ambassador Jan Bazar summarized the spirit of the gathering, underscoring the event's commitment to fostering linguistic diversity and cross-cultural understanding. As the guests unveiled their literary masterpieces to a captivated audience, including eager young minds keen to take in the wisdom of their cultural heritage, the air resonated with animated discussions on the Mongolian language, culture and history. Writer and poet Mindoyo expressed his profound joy in bringing this cultural extravaganza to the Mongolian diaspora in Sweden. The event featured distinguished guests like Swedish actor Leif Olsen, known for his association with Nobel laureate Thomas Transturmer, who captivated the audience with his recitations. Per Bergström, director of the Ramos Publishing House, and Matthias Lafoli, director of Payala's Culture Department, enriched the cultural exchange, highlighting the event's global literary dialogue. It's uh, wonderful to finally, since, since we have had this cooperation since last year and we had Swedish poets being in, in UB and in, in Mongolia, 
and for them to work so close to the Mongolian poetry and to find out more thing about how great it is and differences and equality. It's wonderful now to be able to have these translations printed in Sweden and published and that we had that the poets Mongolian poets have been able to come here and meet the Swedish audience and introduce Mongolian poetry to Swedish readers because Previously, we have not had. There is like almost only one book, uh, anthology of previous anthology of Mongolian poetry, and now we will have more. And people are interested, and people really enjoy um, enjoy taking part of the Mongolian poetry, which have noticed. I mean, today was the first reading we had in Stockholm, but we have. And Oyo has now been a couple of days to a town in northern Sweden, where people have felt very connected to his poetry and really listened to it. So there is, of course, connect differences between Sweden and Mongolian poetry that are interesting, but there are also so much that are connecting and that are, that are similar, that can really go to the heart of the Swedish readers, I would say. I've now read a lot of uh, Mongolian poetry, and I find it's uh, sometimes similar to Swedish poetry, but it has very often to do with nature, but the difference is that you talk much about the sky, the sun, the moon, and the horses, and the horses' tracks uh, on the steps. And that is so fantastic to me, it touches me. Uh, and also, uh, it's so concrete, your poetry. Uh, it's not construct, uh, no construction at all. It's not abstract, it's really Everything is a picture of something that you really experience, so it's so good. And uh, of course the generosity and the friendship of the Mongolian writers and people that I know here, Mend Oyo and so on, uh, helps me a lot to, to, to want to read more about uh, Mongolia, want to know more and also of course read lots of your poetry. Since last year, Poets and translators from both countries have engaged in a fascinating exchange, translating each other's poetry and writings. This cultural dialogue culminated in a two-day showcase where Mongolian poets and writers presented their works to a Swedish audience. This initiative underscores the significant contribution of cultural partnerships to the relations between the two nations. The MC of Mongolia deserves commendation for its excellent organization of this event. <laughs> Amid the poetic ambience, the spring warmth event showcased literature's ability to unite nations and foster lasting friendships across borders. The Tor Bastianini Association awarded the 2024 Bastianini Prize to baritone Amartushun Ingbat. The award ceremony will take place on Friday, May 3rd, thanks to the support of the Historic Literary Society of Verona, which will host the event at its prestigious headquarters in Verona. Entry will be free of charge. The prize is bestowed every two years upon baritones of significant vocal ability. In 2017, the Simone Piazzolla, in 2019, to Nicola Laimo, in 2022, to Dmitry Hvarostovsky and Luka Salsi. Amr Tushik, but born in Mongolia in 1986, is currently one of the most active baritones on the international opera scene. After studying at the State University for Culture and Art in Ulaanbaatar, he began his career in the permanent theatre company of the Mongolian Opera. Winning numerous prestigious national and international competitions, he found success in Italy and has since been invited to perform on the most famous international stages – Teatro alla Scala, Arena di Verona, Opera di Roma, Royal Opera House London, Bayerische Staatsoper, Wiener Staatsoper, Metropolitan Opera New York, Staatsoper Unter der Linden and Deutsche Oper Berlin. His technique, characterized by the burnished timbre of his voice, the rigor and sobriety of interpretation combined with his commendable diction and extensive repertoire presented with passion, firmly places him among the contemporary baritones, especially in the 
field of Verdian opera, but not limited to that. He considers Piero Capuccilli and Ettore Bastianini to be the two singers who have most impressed and inspired him. Thank you for staying with us. Now let's take a look at currency exchange rates provided by Mongol Bank. Next, our program will turn our attention to foreign news, partnered with international news agencies. The European Union is pressing ahead with a plan to use the profits generated from billions of euros of Russian assets frozen in Europe to help provide weapons and other funds for Ukraine, European Union Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell said Tuesday. Borrell got a green light for the plan from most of the bloc's foreign ministers this week, and he hopes European Union leaders will endorse it at the summit in Brussels starting on Thursday. We must know to match the speed of our response with the extent of this threat. By quickly taking the next steps on redirecting the revenues from frozen Asian assets for the benefit of Ukraine. We know that there are 360,000 millions of resources from the Central Bank of Russia, which has been frozen. And we have been discussing for weeks about uh, how to use the revenues of these resources. By the time being, we don't talk about the capital itself, but the windfall profits generated by these assets due to the high increase on interest rates. And after the discussion on the Monday for a First Council, I sent to the Council a proposal, a Council decision, a proposal for a Council decision to allocate the bulk of these revenues to the European Union financial capacity. The move comes as Ukraine runs dangerously low on munitions and U.S. efforts to get fresh funds for weapons have stalled in Congress. The 27-nation European Union is holding around 200 billion euros in Russian central bank assets, most of it frozen in Belgium, in retaliation for Moscow's war against Ukraine. It estimates that the interest on that money could provide around 3 billion euros each year. A small group of member countries, notably Hungary, refused to supply weapons to Ukraine, so these windfall profits would be divided up. Around 90% of the money would be put into a special fund that many European Union countries already used to get reimbursed for arms and ammunition they send. The other 10% would be put into the European Union budget to help bolster Ukraine's defense industry. Countries that object to sending weapons could then claim that they are not arming the country, Borrell said. The European Union budget cannot be used to buy arms under current export interpretations of the bloc's treaties, but the special fund known as the European Peace Facility runs off budget and doesn't have to respect the same legal standards or be approved by the European Parliament. In the past, the European Central Bank has warned against seizing Russian assets as this could undermine confidence in the euro currency and European Union markets, but Borrell said that no assets would be taken, only the windfall profits they make. He added that ECB has been consulted on the plan. Some European Union leaders, including Belgian Prime Minister Alexander de Croo, have said they want to use the windfall profits to fund Ukraine's reconstruction, but Borrell said he believes in preventing destruction first. Well, that's all for today. Thank you for staying with us. We will see you tomorrow with more news and updates. Goodbye.